Hi everybody, it's Bob Ose, and this is Theater Resources Unlimited. Welcome. Welcome to our Friday community gathering. Um, this has been quite a thing that we've been doing for a long time. Uh, this is week 121. We have been doing this for 121 consecutive weeks now. Um, and in case you can't do the math, or in case you didn't realize it, this all started because of COVID. People didn't have any place to go and, and be part of a community. So I said, hey, I got a Zoom account. Let's meet in Zoom. And everybody said, cool, let's do it. So uh, somehow or other, we, we landed on Fridays. Uh, I guess it's the way that people like to end their week. Um, and we get together and we talk about whatever we want to talk about, actually. We, usually it's COVID related. It has been for two, two and a half years, but now we're kind of out of COVID. We're not completely out of COVID, but we're sort of out of COVID. Um, we're, we're not out of COVID enough that they've now come up with a new vaccine specifically geared to the Omicron variants. Um, yum, I can't wait. Uh, so I've already had two, can't wait for my third. Uh, what a world we're living in, isn't it? Um, so at least there's some sense of control about COVID and we're not forced into, into isolation right now. Um, most of us are extending our worlds beyond our apartments and we're going out there and we're, we're daring, we're daring the, um, the, the rest the, the big world out there. Um, and we're daring COVID to find us. <laughs> gotta tell you, COVID, you gotta admire COVID. COVID's really clever. It, it really, it really knows how to find us no matter what we do. Um, but at least we're not getting us sick from it. So there COVID, take that. Um, we talked about creating and shut down. We talked about being lonely and we talked about what our, what our new themes are going to be going, going forward now that we've spent two years um, in a culture and in a world that was unknown to us before. Uh, I, do, I do want to know how many of us really are taking that uh, experience with us into our art. Uh, I hope a lot of us are because this is a time period that will always be notable um, in our history going going forward. And uh, a lot of us really should be working. <laughs> what did I just hear? Um, a lot of us should be really uh, putting that into our art and putting it into our, our writing and um, marking this period of time that we've been through. Um, now that we're in a slightly different transitional place, uh, it, it's been an opportunity for me to talk to people about things other than isolation. I'm trying to get my screen back. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, have conversations going forward that have more to do with the world that we used to know. Um, one thing that's been a, a point of, of conversation, actually, interestingly enough, the very first thing I did on Zoom uh, back in April 17th, uh, no, April actually was later, it wasn't April 17th, April 17th is when we started here in the community gathering. But uh, I, Gretchen Cryer and I had planned on doing a panel discussion about solo performance. And she was producing a series of uh, six solo pieces at the Cherry Lane Theater, including one starring her son, John Cryer, who some of you may know. And COVID said, uh-uh. And we didn't know what to do. And we decided that we would continue to do the panel anyway. We figured that having a panel about solo performance uh, would uh, make sense um, on Zoom. Uh, and we're going to talk about this with, with Stephanie Weissman, who's, who's, all, who's my guest today. We're here to talk about the Marsh, uh, which has been around 33 years and has really been focusing on solo performance. So for, for me, this is like coming full circle because our first, our first community gather, our first Zoom panel discussion, technically, was about solo performance. Um, it's an area that I find of interest in. It's, I found it of particular interest as we entered shutdown because it seemed to me that, uh, an art form that it was most adaptable to virtual performance. And I'm going to bring uh, Stephanie in now if she will, she'll turn on her um, 
there you go. Let's turn on our video. How do you say in English video? Um, and I want to introduce you to the room, Stephanie. Thank you for being with us. St Stephanie's been a loyal um, part of the true community. And uh, it took me like a couple times of her being here before I finally realized that this was the same Stephanie Weissman that, that l was the head of the leader of this amazing organization called The Marsh uh, in San Francisco. So tell us about Tell us about the marsh. Tell us about yourself, first of all. The first thing that I actually want to know is, where did your interest in solo performance come from and why did you decide to start the marsh? Well, I was at the University of Buffalo. I was getting my graduate degree. I finished my graduate degree in uh, poetry and creative writing. But I decided it was time to leave Buffalo. So I went on a little mini country tour and I ended up in Santa Fe and San Francisco. And when I was in San Francisco, I saw Spalding Gray. And uh, I said, whoa! The Spalding, the Spalding Gray factor, of course. Yes, swimming to Cambodia. And I saw the first part and then I was like, I had to see the second part and I had to be in the front row, which was all set off for uh, the press to come. And nobody came. No press was there. Can you imagine? So I jumped over from the second row to the first row, and I got to watch him in the first row. And when I saw him, I said, this is it. This is the theater I love. And I went back to Buffalo, where I had just won a Niska grant to tour on, on one of my performance pieces I wrote. Well, it was a poetry piece, and I decided to turn it into a solo performance. So around, I went to different places around the state, and then I had my final show, which was a solo performance, and I didn't know anything about what I was doing. In fact, the po woman who's doing my postcards said, who's going to do your lights? And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> So I was saved and she did my lights because it was just Buffalo and they, they rented a theater for me and all that, but nobody knew about theater because they were poets. So I actually walked into a theater and did my first solo performance of my play and almost died, but I got through it and it was also my going away party. So when I got to San Francisco, I decided I want to do solo performance, but how? So I went and I auditioned for Brava and there was like, 7,000 people I was auditioning with. Oh, maybe. You, I'm sorry, you, you said you were auditioning for where? Brava, used to do so. Can, can everybody, oh. can you hear me okay? Is I can okay? hear you fine, yeah. Okay, Brava. And they had these auditions for women to do solo performances. And there was like 300 people auditioning and they didn't choose me. Well, st stupid them. I know. Poo on them. <laughs> I asked them why. And they said, too iconoclastic. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? So I was like, huh, too iconoclastic. And because I have some kind of ego, I didn't get diminished by it. I got enraged. So um, I tried to figure out how to do this. You know, how do you do it? So I started the march. And I started the march because I knew that I didn't know what I was doing in theater. And so I decided, and why was it so hard? It should be easy to try to develop work. Well, you, you touched on something that, that I think is, uh, is a very important part of solo performance. The fact that you, that you wind up at, at some point or other in your career as a solo artist, you wind up doing everything. You said that somebody said to you, who's going to do your lights? It's like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, who's going to do your publicity? Who's going to do your lights? Uh, where's your set going to come from? Um, you're you're kind of doing doing a lot of it. Now, now not all solo performers are are on their own, but a lot are. So, uh, can you tell me how you um, have guided other solo artists who come, who have come through the marsh? And have you have you been teaching them all those tricks that they need to know in order to have a full production with people coming? <laughs> Bob, I try. What? I try. You we try. try. Okay. We okay. try very much and we do. So, I mean, the Mars started out as four 15 minute pieces at the Hotel Utah, a bar. That's where we started. 
And so it was just getting, you know, getting people to do it. So that was each person had to go twice. They got to go twice in a month. So that was how did they find how did they find you or how did you find them? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we put it out into our communities and it just was an immediate it was the right time. It was e and we made it easy. We made it easy. And, and I think that that was so much the point. I wanted to make it easy. So to at least start now, obviously, it gets harder as you move up the chain, so to speak, you have a 15 minute piece, we still have that series, it's called the Monday Night Marsh, people uh, just put in a script or whatever. And it's not that hard to get into that program. But then the program moves if you have a full length piece, which we haven't done as much since COVID, but we have a Marsh Rising, which is basically an audition for a full length piece. And from the Marsh Risings, we have our premieres, you know, of our full length pieces. So it, it kind of moves in a way from soup to nuts. And we have classes because if somebody comes, uh, you know, because kind of like what I learned with that first solo performance was, you know, I needed some support. So I'd say instead of embarrassing yourself after your first performance, when you don't know what the heck you're doing, take a class. So what we try to do is provide all entrees and ways to do it. Now, when you ask about the whole business aspect of which I'm very interested, I, did, I used to teach at SUNY Buffalo a class called Small Press Publishing. My mentor was Robert Creeley. I was editor of the Black Mountain 2 Review. And I learned how, I was an editor, so I had to learn how to be an editor. And I didn't know how to be run an arts journal. So kind of like the Marsh, I just started, I was a graduate student, so I could start a class. So I started a class called Small Press Publishing, where I taught everybody different aspects of publishing. And out of that, we always produced one publication. And so in the same way, I translated that into something we call the solo, uh, the performance initiative, which in one route is, it's a nine month, a nine month, uh, period of developing a work where people meet once a week but the each week we teach about the business of producing and each month is a different a different section and then at the end of it we have a, a performance festival well um as the guy that found the true which is an organization that's dedicated to producers in some ways <clears throat> we're always interested in the business part of it but I'm going to actually ask you about about both sides of it. I want I want to know more about the business um, to share with with people out in the room and who are watching us. And I also want to know more about the art of the solo um, solo performance. Now you started it started it all started with Spalding Gray. What was it that you identified, or were you able to identify back then what it was about solo performance that you find found compelling? And has any of that evolved or changed over the years? Um, would would you have the same response to Spalding Gray to, today that you had 33 years ago or 34 years ago, probably? Although that's hard to say because I've been watching performances for 33 years now. I think so. I was just on the edge of my seat. I was so interested in what he, he was doing, the intimacy, the authenticity of it. Okay, it was, so those, yeah. those are two things. So, so intimacy and authentic, authenticity. So I, I want to try to parse this thing called solo performance and and give people some clues as to what makes a good solo performance so keep keep going just you could just talk you'll it'll all come out well i think you know when when you say that some of our first performers that we did full length when we moved from the hotel utah to morty's and then finally into full-time place where we went from one show a week to 15 shows a week um the first person to do a full length piece was Josh Kornbluth. And uh, Marga Gomez actually did her first, our first little workshop of a piece. And the thing that they both came to the solo performance with was this amazing relationship to the audience. And it was a translation for them. And this isn't true across the board, but stand up comics who translate into solo performance well make incredible solo performers because of their relationship to the audience well it's interesting that you say that because um i have a i have a question the first question I, I tend to ask people i've helped people develop solo pieces and i've cabaret 
cabaret shows as well as solo pieces. And the first thing I, I always ask them is, what is your relationship to the audience? Why are you telling the story and who are you telling it to? Um, what are some of the answers to that question? The, the intimacy with the audience, of course, is, is key, but who is the audience? Who is the audience? It's an interaction between somebody on stage and an audience. So who is the audience? It, it, it probably changes from piece to piece, doesn't it? Yeah, I just think it's, 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 the, it's the incredible relationship to each person in the, in the audience, because there is almost a one-on-one -on -one thing with solo performance, because it's not like in an ensemble, it's you and them. And I think the solo performers here, and you know Don Reed, who's an incredible stand-up comic, you know, being Jay Leno's warm-up comic for ten, you know, six, seven, ten years, his relationship to each person in the, you know, obviously he's not relating to every single person, but if you're good at it, it feels like it. So, um, there's there's so many things I want to actually uh, ask you. Uh, I'm trying to do it in some sort of orderly fashion. Uh, I, we're still talking about the art of, of performance here. Uh, there's other things I'm going to talk about with you. Um, what do you What do you think are some of the mistakes that solo some solo per, uh, performers make when they put together a solo show? What What doesn't work as well? Well, it's it's not being able to translate the narcissism of a solo story into something that is meaningful to everyone, to everyone, to put it into the social context or whatever context it happens to be. And so it, the reason you're telling the story isn't because you just want to tell your story. The reason you're telling your story is you want to tell your story and the impact it has because it impacts in each person's life almost whether there, it's a, an exact direct link to something that's happened to them, it, it more than likely they can, the people who watch can relate to it in some way. You know, they may not have been something horrible happened to them, but there's something there. And in, and in, or in, if it, it expands people's mind, you know, it's the story of a person, it's believable, it doesn't necessarily, it's most of the time, it's not fiction. So it allows you to expand your consciousness about the people in the world. And, you know, like Irma Herrera's, you know, why would I mispronounce my name, right? You know, like, what is that? And why did, and why did I do it? <laughs> well, and why did I do it? You know, Irma, sorry. We try, but occasionally, you know, but you know what I mean? It's like, why, how do we meet the world? And each person's story expands that experience to people or reflects and mirrors that experience. So the universality uh, is, one, is one of the things that, that any, any of us need to find, whether we're writing a, a full length play with 20 characters or a solo piece, we're always looking for the themes that are universal. Um, and you're, you're saying that the intimacy between the solo performer and the audience is one of the keys that, that, that makes you passionate about this particular art form. Um, what I was asking before was, do you think it's, can it, can it be useful for a solo performance to make a strong um, choice about, Uh, about who uh, who the audience is to them. What did the relate? What the specific relationship? Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the uh, there's the opening of the, to Amadeus. It's not a solo performance, but there's a very long monologue that opens Amadeus, and the answer is why is Salieri going on and on and on and on uh, to us? And the answer that I heard from from some some people that I think were smart. Um, we're posterity, and he's trying to justify himself to posterity. He's trying to get forgiveness. He's trying to acting is always there's always an action involved. There's always something that you want to achieve. Um, so I, when I think about solo performance, I always think about making sure that you you have something that you're trying to achieve, a goal that you have in your solo performance, and that's why you're telling your story. You're telling it for a reason. Does does is that just too erudite and intellectual and I'm, I'm just being silly about it. Oh, I'm sure you're not being so silly about it. I just don't know how to answer the question. Oh, okay. All right. 
uh, in case you didn't figure it out, I'm also passionate about solo performance. So I'm, I'm going off a little bit. I should, I should leave it in your hands uh, as much as possible. Um, the one thing I wanted to get back to that I think you could, you could still answer if you thought about it is how your relationship to solo performance has changed from when you first started to now. What do you know now that you wish you'd, that you, you might've found useful to know back then? Huh. I mean, for me, it's been an evolution, right? Here I am, I know nothing basically about theater. I have a degree in master's in poetry, right? And it's just been the blossoming of wanting to give people their voice. I mean, that's an important aspect of it is giving people their voice and, and letting them put it out into the world and then seeing how it opens up, seeing how things get developed. You know, you've got this little seed, what kind of a support system do you need to develop this seed? How far are you willing to take it? You know, uh, learning how to get a, a like a dramaturg like David Ford involved, who's done so many of our performances and worked worked with our performance performers to really expand the depth of their story to to make it go. So it's not like I didn't think about that in the beginning, but watching it evolve and open up has been incredible as well as for whatever reason, you know, then making the next step happen. And it always seemed to happen appropriately. You know, we had this space, we got kicked out of it, we moved into another, we moved into another, we built, you know, we, we bought the building. When you buy the building, what happens? How does that expand the notion? So it's been about this wonderful evolution for me of being inspired by where we are and moving it forward. Well, you just uh, touched on a, another key thing that I wanted to talk about, which was the, the evolution of your, of your theater. Um, how, how early on did you actually find have your space? Because uh, And I actually want to talk about how buying your space might have changed things. Uh, I, want to, I want to hear your, your, your take on that. But you, you Let's go back to first there was Spald, once upon a time there was Bold and Gray. Then, then there were uh, these two or three people that you, uh, that had solo performances that you presented at the, what was it called? Well, our full length one started at the Cafe Bino. Cafe Bino, okay. So um, that was your home. That was your home space for a while. How, how long did, did you have that space? We were there about nine months before we got kicked out because of a building code violation, which had nothing to do with us. Oh, okay. Um, so then you had to find another space. Right, but that space, so many shows, unbelievable, the amount of shows we did in that space, how many they sold out. I think three of them were optioned for film that first year of full length stuff. It was just an amazing time. And once again, how did people find you? Well, we had a publicist. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Word of mouth not social media you know yeah it was free social media but there was no i mean in that first year i don't think we got a single review because they we weren't we weren't on the reviewer's site at that point we weren't on their list yet but the shows just i mean josh kornbluth marga gomez susan van allen yehuda hyman i mean merle kessler ian shoals i on charlie varin unbelievable number of shows we did that first year and what was your model how did you how did you run this this company in case somebody's thinking about doing what you what you did how did you, know, you keep it running well i became when i moved here became a, um because of my small press publishing class i got a job as a desktop publishing i mean you're looking at the oldest both first and probably oldest desktop publishing teacher in the world I started teaching PageMaker, if anybody remembers what that is, it turned into InDesign six weeks after it came out. So for whatever reason, be, be, you know, be, between my skills that I had from editing this, I learned how to be an, an artistic director from Robert Creeley because we spent our time discussing what made uh, poetry work. 
how to how to be how to edit an arts journal, which I translated into becoming an artistic director of the Marsh and finding it or founding it. When when did you actually name it? I named it because I lived on a marsh on Delaware Bay for three months. No, my question is when when in your in your journey did you did you actually pick the name and say this is what we're, what we're called? As soon as I started the theater. <laughs> oh, so right right away. Okay, got it. All right. Because it was such a vibrant, fertile grounds, those that marsh. So that's why it's the marsh, a breeding ground for new performance. Okay. Um, I want to remind the room that we have a chat there for you to put questions in. And actually, if you could put, start them with a cue that, that'll that'll hopefully draw my attention to it. So I'll know that you have a question or a comment. Um, if there are things that we're touching on and you'd like to know more about them. Uh, let us know if there are things that you would rather have me ask Stephanie. You can also let me know that. Um, I have my own thing about performance. I have my own own passions that I have that that may not be yours. So you can always say, "What about this? What about that?" Just let us know that you want to talk about something. Um, so one of the things that that I found astonishing about you is that you not only found a theater space, you bought it. Um, not everybody can do that. So uh, how, how, did, how did that happen? And, and was it a diff difficult decision or was it just an obvious thing that was just the next step for you? It just seemed clear that that was where you were heading. Well, what happened was our fifth move was into 1062 Valencia, which we rented, right? We had thrown out of our last space, we moved into another space in between, and then I kept walking up and down the street and seeing this place that was for rent. Or it wasn't for rent, it was not being used. So I called and found out about this place. So that was in 1992. We basically became full-time in 90. We started in 89, but we became full-time in 1990. So, yes. Well, buying a space is a lot of responsibility. So did that shift you at all in terms of how, where your energy was, was, was being focused? Well, for whatever reason, I think I would call it, I'm somewhat spatially defunct and my entire compass is where me going forward. If I'm going forward, I believe not, I'm not irrational, but I know, understand my true belief. If I'm going forward, I'm going North, which is absolutely ridiculous. I understand that, but there's something about me. So I never thought about the responsibilities. I thought, what's next? What's north? And what happened was I knew that we could not survive another move. And we, for some reason, the lawyer who put together our lease, thank you, Peter Buchanan, who's long gone, um, put in that we had the right of first refusal on the building. So when the building, a union opened, the Linoleum and Tile Workers Union owned the building. And we just had the theater space, but there was two other big spaces in the building. They put it on the market. They had to go through us before they could put it, open it to the market. And I said, and it was the bottom of the market time. We bought this building for a song. It's worth 25 times what we paid for it right now. Okay, slightly exaggerating, but not much. And uh, um, I said, we will not exist. We need to buy this building. Now, I have to tell you, most people thought I was absolutely bonkers. The amount of time, money we made that year in 1996 was $160,000. That was our income. And I said, we're going to buy this building. And then I spent the next eight months fine. I had to get four loans to do it. Four loans. And, You're and very, very, very brave. It wasn't feel like brave. It was like, okay, now this, now this. What I'm saying is, it was just step after step after step. And finally, at the very last moment, there used to be a Taekwondo studio on top of us. And they had to give us that, what you call it. They had to, I forget what it's called, where they had to approve it because they were a renter. And uh, they, they tried to stop the sale because they wanted it. Oh. And after eight months, it was all going to go down the drain. But the bank was a family bank and it was, you know, I got two community banks, a board member backed it through a bank, 
backed the loan than two community organization banks. And there was the top loan was a bank loan. So it was for very little. It was under maybe $150,000. And they said, oh, you won't sign off on this. We'll, we'll, let, we'll, let you, we'll still let you have it. And I have to say, our escrow officer almost hit the floor because that had never happened before. No, no bank had ever said, go ahead without this estoppel agreement signed. Estoppel. <laughs> So, so you're you're, 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 very, you're very you're very blessed, obviously. I mean, there's, the the universe really wanted you to do this. It's it's clear. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very hard work. But it kept going. You know, it wasn't going against the grain. It was in the muck, but it was go It went forward. Now you t you tipped your hat to uh, answer that I was looking for before, but that you didn't give me. I wanted to know what your what your uh, model was for this for the for your business. You had a board. You, you said you said a board member helped you, so yes. you actually uh, bec you were you became a not for profit. Uh, yes, yes. We were not, yes, we were non profit from ninety two on, and we bought the building in ninety six. Okay, so you had some structure to your company, but did you have anybody besides you doing doing the work? I my uh, board member Philip Armour was my partner, and he and I just worked 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 to move all the board members helped but he was a partner of another level and you know we just were best friends and we moved this thing together well i'm actually glad to hear that you didn't do it all by yourself because that you could have could have gone nuts from it probably it's good that you had somebody with you um i'm looking at a couple of things in the in the chat um Jennifer Joy says, so do all of your big shows now come through Marsh Rising? Did I, did I miss something that what you call, what is Marsh Rising? Did I miss that? Well, the Marsh Rising, although I must say we haven't had it since COVID, but previous, oh. Oh. every show that wants to go premiere on our main stage, almost every show, of course, there's always exceptions at the Marsh, but they, they do a Marsh Rising because for me, I'm not interested in reading a script I am interested in seeing what the performer, how the performer is going to do. And additionally, it's a, you know, the Marsh is not traditional theater. We're a partnership with our artists and we need to know what this partnership is going to be like. And so what the Marsh Rising does is both supply both the aesthetics, you know, does it, does it work for the Marsh? as I watch that audition. And it also provides how is this partnership with the artist going to work? Okay, um, where's the next question? Um, Donald Loftus says, do you have relationships with other theaters where one of yours can move into onto other theater, one of your shows can move into another theater? And what is the normal run? How many performances do you do for, for uh, your solo pieces? So the first thing about our shows is it's, I call it the Holly, Off-Broadway Plus approach. And that is we let our shows run as long as there's a good enough audience to keep it going. And you know, now that we have a, we have two theaters in uh, San Francisco, we have one plus a cabaret, second space. Now, when you, when you say all these, you're talking about all these spaces, you have, you know, there's only one that you own, or do you have more than one space in, in the building that you own? We have two spaces in the building we own. Okay. In San Francisco. We have two spaces in the building we rent in Berkeley. So, and when we run out of space, we do <laughs> I have a, one show that might do Thursdays and Saturdays, and then one show might do Friday and Sundays. We do a five o'clock show and an 830 show. So we can we have run 800 shows, 600 to 800 shows in a year. How many on average are you juggling at one time? It depends, you know, COVID has slowed us down, but we could have juggled. <laughs> Well, so main stage shows, we have juggled six to eight, not always, but then we have the Monday Night March, the Marsh Risings, the, the other stuff as well, the youth program we have. So there's a lot that goes on. So we can run our shows a long time because we can put them in different theaters. So one of the, in terms of them moving places, right? So they can run as long. When I said uh, one thing I didn't mention, when I said off Broadway plus, because we want our performers to have, you know, the biggest life for the show that they can, that if they get a New York off Broadway run, which quite a few have, 
we let them leave and then they can come back. And that's the Off-Broadway Plus thing. So, um, you know, our shows have run all over the country and the world. What's your relationship with, your, with the writer that comes in? <clears throat> um, are, you, are you just a host? Are, are you a, a, a producer for some of them? Or are, you, are you the host for some of them? Um, do you have a future participation with any of the shows that you bring in? Yes, we, the... we signed a contract. We, we have a contract with- She said uh, laughingly, okay. <laughs> we, we get a percentage of if the shows go on go and, to other places and has, has that been a, a, an important part of your i, I keep going, coming back to your business model this has that been an important part of what's what's helped kept keeping you running or is it very minimal it's very minimal okay it's very minimal the show you, didn't pro, you didn't produce rent you're not at new york theater workshop right so. we haven't done anything like that i would say the marsh isn't necessarily celebrity hollywood based we're like we're like you know ground roots and the shows go far they go to fringe fest and a lot of times they'll go to a fringe festival before they'll do a rising because that's what they tell them to do because they said that i'll more likely say yes if they're better at the rising so they do fringes first so they go around before and then they go around after well um okay uh let me see let me get back to this questions um donald loftus wants to know what, what your spaces are like you you've identified two spaces in the building that you own and two spaces in the building that you rent. And I think you implied that there are probably other spaces that you use when you need to, like an ad hoc. Um, no, no, we have two spaces in San Francisco and two in our, we have a Berkeley Marsh and a San Francisco Marsh. We so you, don't so you, so you cut yourself off at four, did you? <laughs> we have four spaces. Although okay. sometimes we don't need the cafe. We have moved into yeah. other, we really haven't moved, but that's in our space, right? So. We don't, we, we do enough. We don't try to move outside. Uh, you know, we, we will occasionally be in association with other shows and other theaters. Are the generally proscenium stages he wants to know? There are black boxes. They black all, boxes, okay. they all uh, run about a hundred, 120. They're small. Okay. And the only place that has a liquor license would be your cafe, I suppose. The liquor license is is in Berkeley. It's in the entire space. The Berkeley oh. space is twelve thousand square feet, and it's you know it's a it's they're both about the same size. Do you have a place for my for my office there? <laughs> well, you mean you're moving to San Berkeley? <laughs> you just said twelve thousand square feet is like oh boy, um, I'm I'm in a well it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm in a small space. Um, so the next question up is, well, Catherine Keats is brilliant producer. Now I want, I want to know what does producer mean to you? Um, how, what is, what is your, what are the skills that you bring to producing? Um, and how do you do what you do? How do you get those shows all happening? Organization, I would say would probably be up there. Very organ. You must be very, you know, I have a, you know, now I have a great team, you know, that, you know, I work with, um, it's, you know, my role feels like it's choosing the shows and then it's working with the artists to, to make to hopefully make them get the best show they can. And so and it's by providing like a, a good publicist. We work with Carla Befra. She was on for a while. I don't know if she's still on. She's our publicist. So we have a really good publicist. We have in-house uh, social media. Um, a general manager who deals with all the day-to-day -day stuff and, you know, and we work with people on posters, you know, like the simple things like, please, you know, this is how you lay your poster out. Make sure you put the date in, which isn't going to make it a better show, but it's going to make sure everybody knows what year the show happened in, which is a common, common mistake. People don't put the, the year in of the show. Um, you know, and I'll watch them and I'll say, hey, at a rising, I'll say, I like this. I said, but this is what I feel you need to work out. And they won't work it out with me. They'll work it out with the director. We provide the classes. We provide, you know, we have great directors that work with us. The Performance Initiative helped us to get the next generation of directors that people work with. And over the years, they've, there's the, you know, like the performers are also a community. So we've developed this community of performers who work together and give each other tips and support each other. And they, you know, try this acting coach and try this voice teacher, or you need this kind of musical assistance. So it's just, a, it's really a community that supports 
each of the individual artists and the whole community. When you uh, are considering uh, bringing a piece in, uh, is it purely an artistic judgment or, or do you do you ever have concerns about whether somebody's actually going to be able to, to make it happen, whether they have the, the business know-how beyond the art beyond the art that they have, that they create. That's what I find out at the Marsh Rising. You know, they have to promote their own piece. We don't promote it because we actually don't, if we're gonna do a run, we don't wanna take away from, from who's gonna come. So they have to do all the work, figure out how to do it. And it lets me see if we think it's gonna be a success, if in we can work together. In general, what do you offer somebody who comes in? Do you offer them any kind of uh, marketing support? Do you offer them a tech, a tech person or? Uh, a, a, we, we offer te a tech person, a house manager, ticketing. We do the ticketing, we a publicist, social media, but we don't do their posters and postcards and things like that. Um, now to go back to the, the arc of your history, um, at what point in your development of the marsh did you have what you would call a substantial audience base? And do you, do you actually, have you developed, I assume that you have a, a developed an audience base. How could you not have it after all this time? Well, we, I'm t that Cafe Bino was so packed. Every show almost, it was unbelievable. And it you was, grabbed everybody's, was it emails back then? I guess it was. Right, because when I, when I started to talk about me being this desktop publishing teacher, so I learned everything about the Macintosh computer. And I used all the resources because I taught Excel and FileMaker and Word and PageMaker. So basically from the beginning, we did it all on the Mac. We are such an, a Macintosh based organization because we could do everything through that. So I have the databases that we made people sign from day one. Um, so you do you do give them some guidance uh, in terms of the business aspects of it. You would, but but you also want to know that they have some kind of understanding and some type, some kind of willingness. Um, I run into this a lot. I'm I'm a writer, I'm a playwright, composer, lyricist. So that's where that's what my primary identity is as an artist. Uh, but I've over the years I've met so many people who think that. They, they don't have to know they don't have to understand business it's some somehow business damages their art if they know business it's going to somehow infect them and they're not going to be as creative and as as i, I don't think that's true I, I think that there's some people that can make it true for themselves but um we're always trying to get people to open up and allow the possibility of thinking in business terms and understanding the business i think that you have a much better career if you understand the business some people may tell me I'm wrong. I don't know. Um, Tita says, would love more about the challenge. One, I guess I mentioned at the beginning, what you've learned about how to control and shape an artist's personal stuff, ego, and connect to audience interests. Uh, have, have there any been, have there been any, has there been any, any evolution in your understanding of the solo artist that, that like, would you advise them the same way today that, that you would advise them at the very, very, very beginning? Have you learned, what have you learned that you can share with them? I mean, I think I, I've probably knew most of it in the beginning, but I've learned to communicate it differently. And also hopefully to provide more support as the years have gone on. So we have, I mean, we've always had David Ford to be our dramaturg from day one. He did Josh Kornbluth and Marga's show. So, um, so you have you do have a, a dramaturg, and um, is that an optional th uh, relationship that that most people do or don't uh, enter into? Well, you know, most some people do, some people don't. So David Ford's much more of a than a dramaturg. He basically co-develops the show with the performers. Not everybody works with him. That is for sure. Not everybody works with him, but a lot of people do. So, you know, if they come in and don't have a, if I, you know, like most people. Just about to ask coming, this. Huh? I was just about to ask this, the director. Yeah. I mean, there are very few people that don't have a director. But if they don't, I've seen what their show is. And I, I you know, so if they don't have a director, I can still say yes, because I've seen the show as part of the Marsh Risings. But what do you 
How important do you think a director is for a solo show? I know what I know what I think. I think it's crucial, but it's absolutely crucial. It's also, you know, this co-development um, uh, notion or whatever you want to call it, support system is one thing, a, you know, and the director, uh, I mean, that's going to put the shine on the show for most shows. It's going to, it's going to clean it up. It's going to stage it. Now, the thing about solo performance is a lot of it's not as staged, obviously, as a, you know, a set. There's a lot of, most of the sets are simple. So there's a lot less perhaps of that um, kind of need um, because, you know, like think of Spalding Gray. I mean, he just sat behind a desk with a map behind him in swimming to Cambodia and that worked well. We have much more physical performances like, you know, Dan Hoyle just finished Talk to Your People and he's got, he worked with Charlie Varon and, you know, he's got whatever, 12, 15 characters in it. He's very physically based. So there's the very physically based performers. There's the not physically based, <laughs> you know, they're all over the place in solo performance. Um, Candy Carl wants to know whether you, whether you are, are engaged at all in outreach and touring. Um, do, you, do you help people find uh, uh, other places to do their shows? Do you connect people to other people? Um, to some extent. And in fact, Yael Shikali, who runs, uh, who in the past and maybe the future, uh, you know, APAP, uh, the shows there, we did March on Tour, for instance, and we brought four shows, I think, to the last one that happened, I guess, 2020, right? We had four shows there. And, you know, and Irma said that she's going to Tennessee, and I think that's a, a direct result of that kind of um you know, relationship with uh, the APAP and Yale and, and those those kind of things. So you're a valuable resource for people that don't have a network. So th they they come to you if they become part of your community. They really are part of a very large community of, of solo performers. Right. And they will, you know, like I, I had talked Sharon Eberhardt, who has a show also coming up in the fall. I mean, she just went to um, Edmonton in Canada, that that fringe festival. Ed, Ed, Edmonton, yeah. You know, and so we she was saying, and this this person told me this one's a good fringe festival, and this one. So they all talk, you know, they have they don't all talk, but many they talk. They're really a community and and that's the thing I did not know was gonna happen, I have to say when I started it. And it's just such an amazing part of, of the marsh and the community is the community that's built up around it and through um through um, COVID and and um, through our Marsh stream, the digital uh, broadcast we started um, platform, we've now have a much, you know, an even increased um, community from around the country and world. You know, we do an international solo fest now, and, you know, it's just increased in, amazingly who who our, how our community has increased during this time seems like it probably has a lot to do with you um you're very you're very uh in, inclusive and seem like you're very, you're really wonderful to work with i'm glad to have you here as a guest we have a lot of questions but there's so many things that i wanted to ask you i, I want to jump i just want to jump before we come back to questions everybody in the room i'm going to get to your questions i promise you um i said at the beginning in my introduction that I thought that the easiest move in COVID for, for of, of any of the art forms was probably the solar performance going going virtual. Um, do you agree with that, or do you have any strong disagreements about that? Uh, you talked about how important the relationship is with the uh, with the audience, and you don't have that intimacy. You don't have that in intimacy on virtual. But I thought that the form itself lived well within the, within the frame. Well, you know, so we started Marsh Stream three weeks after we got shuttered on March 13th. And we did our first full, you know, like our first full solo performance. Uh, we had a performer spotlight on the weekends and it was Wayne Harris's show. And it was not, well, it, pretty, it was okay. It was all that, but I could tell, but watching it, I cried because I could see that the emotionality of solo performance worked 
even if it wasn't the perfect production. And when I saw that, like I said, I cried because this is my idea. I've been for a long time to go digital and to let the world see more of our shows and those that could just see them in our theaters. And watching that, those first digital spotlights of these performances, it was like so, thank, I was just like, oh my God, it works, it works. And it's such a great um, venue. I call it the digital black box. It's such a great thing for solo performance. It's the perfect transition because it's filmic, it's authentic, and it also allows intimacy because we always have a talk back after. There's always a relationship to the performer and the performance that can happen on uh, the Zoom, the digital, in the digital black box. And the, the, the thing that we've learned that, that surprised many of us was that there actually is a lot of intimacy in, in uh, virtual performance because the audience is up close. Uh, the, your, the, your face is, is there. Uh, you're, you're much more palpable and much more visible uh, than you would be if you're like 20 feet away in a theater. Um, so it's, it's a different experience. And I, I, I understand all the people that feel that you don't get the kind of feedback audience feedback that that you've that a lot of us feed on um and i know that there are things that are challenging about it but it seems like the intimacy of per, of solo performance is indeed like you said it's very well suited for what did you call it the something black the, the digital black box the, digi the digital black box um so we, we've we've learned a lot. COVID is COVID has taught us a lot of a lot of lessons. Um, I, I I now never I never think of virtual performances as, as not being intimate. There isn't it isn't interactive, but it is intimate. Um, let's see. Uh, Pam Dudley says, I imagine you've learned a ton about solo shows that don't do well. I kind of asked this earlier. Uh, any tips, recommendations, warnings? What 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 is less likely to work in a solo show? What are things that what are some pitfalls that people can sort of sidestep? Narcissism. <laughs> well, the very act is narcissistic, but uh, but you you're you had said earlier if you can translate your narcissism narcissism into something that's more universal and something that that speaks to more people than just your just your mother. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just that and you got to work you know there's three there's three pillars there's there's the business there's the aesthetic and then there's just the technical know-how and you have to work hard i mean solo performance is the hardest performance to do you are alone on that stage with 60 minutes you're not with another person that's saying oh how do you remember in a solo performance so the work and and you know it's athletic to get through it you know, you have to, you know, to get through the whole thing from start to finish without any other partnerships on stage with you, it's, it's hard work. And so you can't, you know, like you gotta like spend the whole day getting ready for it. I mean, you know, it's not an easy form in any, in any, any uh, sense of the word. Well, one thing I'd like to say to Pam about, about that is that's, that's the reason why you have a director. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you, when you're very close to your work and, and you're the solo performance performer doing your own work, you don't see yourself. So a, a director can actually help it be less narcissistic uh, in, in a sense. He, uh, it can help you transcend um, your very, very, very personal reasons for doing this and allow people to come, allow an audience in. Uh, that's, that's the thing is you have to basically allow the audience in you you have to have enough distance so that they can look at you and relate um and yet we know as as we've established it's also very intimate um this is I, this this is a whole conversation that I, I bet we could we could have for like an hour or two about what makes what help what what tamps down the narcissism of a show that you've written about yourself and starring yourself um, and you're presenting on on a stage to people that you want to reach, you want to communicate with. Uh, so narcissism is a hard word. 
and let's I mean I just want to acknowledge the fact that we, we say that word with the understanding that it probably makes people feel creepy and go oh god I hope I'm not narcissistic when I do this you have to be narcissistic to be to be a writer to begin with so it's not unacceptable it's just finding <sighs> finding the balance exactly it's just finding the balance and maybe that's not the right word but it's like how do you open up your story to be inclusive to the world and you know it's been so interesting i, I see don reed was talking about the organic desert diversity that exists at the marsh because you know with all the stuff we never we've always been incredibly diverse and i mean it's just because it's i what we do is the stories of our time i don't have a season and i say we have one of these and one of these and one of these it's the stories in our landscape that are burbling up. And that for some reason means we've never had to worry about diversity because those stories are diverse. Um, Sue Horowitz uh, asks whether you do two person shows as well as solo shows. I would assume that, that the answer is clearly solo shows. Or do, do you no, do one? No, 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 we, no. That's not true. Oh, we'll say so what do you, you do other other things? We do other stuff. Place. It just happens that solo performance has been the the top focus point. In fact, I'm working with a show right now with Catherine, who's going to open the Hummingbirds, which it is solo and incredible. But the two of us are working on my new show, which will probably be a two hander. Okay, so you're doing a two hander. How dare you? <laughs> I know. I wrote an opera with a chamber, uh, you know, I've done nothing, the solo works, <laughs> anyway, whatever. Um, Don uh, Loftus says it would be great if we had a Manhattan Marsh, um, and I, I don't disagree with that. We have some solo performance opportunities here in Manhattan, we do. Um, Manhattan Marsh, God, lots of storefronts available, yes, a director and a coach for character work. Um, Irma, I did a preview show at APAP as part of Marsh on tour in January 2020. Uh, okay, that's not a question. Let me see if I can find any more. Um, Candy's agreeing with, I'm so far behind on these questions. It's, it's, I'm so sorry. I totally agree with you, Bob. You're on your own, and particularly you must know the business side of your art. Yes, everybody, please, please be open to understanding the business, whether you're a solo performer, or a playwright, an actor, a director, whatever, understand the business. Um, and you already commented on Don's comment about the organic diversity that, that exists. Well, of, of course, of course. I mean, it basically, the, the, the only judgment in, in a solo performance environment is, is your story worth telling? And we understand that Broadway has not been as open to as many stories that are worth telling as it could have been. And hopefully things are gonna be changing now. But in the solo world, I don't think, that I've, I've never come across it. Everybody has been welcome to tell their story in the solo world, uh, as, long, as long as I've known about solo performance, which is 20 or 30 years now. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's even as long as you've been doing this. Maybe it's more than 30 years. Um, let's see. Does including a musical director instrumentalist mean my show still counts as a solo performance? Well, I mean, I think a solo, like for instance, my one solo performance, Breed and Rescue, had a pianist on the stage with me. It was a solo performance musical. I think that's still a solo performance. And at the Marsh, it doesn't matter because we do solo performances, but it's not like we're confined to one person necessarily on stage. Okay, I'm going through these. Ah, Irma gives us a little a little insight into this. As a lawyer for three decades, I want to explain everything, make my case, so to speak. When I see Rebecca Fisher, her director, eyes when she sees Rebecca Fisher's eyes glaze over, she knows that she needs to rewrite. Um, and also David Ford has helped her to simplify and tell stories in a more theatrical way. Um, yeah, all of these things are, are, are good elements to, to have in our toolbox when we're... And, and I just wanna say something about Irma. I mean, I think Irma we would call, we have a whole group of what we call citizen performers. 
So performers like Irma, who comes as a lawyer and decides she has a story to tell and suddenly has to become a solo performer, that's quite a journey. Well, I think that the two, the two elements of, of, of uh, art for any, any artist are ex self-expression and communication. There's, this is the two things. There's, there's self-expression is when we're, when we're writing it, the communication is when we're trying to connect with whoever our audi audience is, reader or audience member, whatever. And we have to be aware of both. And if, if we are not aware of the fact that we're not communicating because we're so into our own ideas or into ourself, um, we need somebody to give us an outside eye and say, I know what you tried to do here, but it's not really communicating to, to the audience. So I, I think that's why it's so important to have a director. I keep going back to that. I think a director is hugely important. Um, we're at 634. I mean, I could, uh, I could ask people if they want to raise their hand and, and ask other questions before we before we wrap up. Uh, I don't know, uh, Stephanie, how are you for time? Are you able to stay a little longer if people have questions? I Yes. I mean, I've, I just shot, feel like I'd rather race through a field of questions already, but um, there may be other things that we haven't completely answered to people's satisfaction or questions that you may have about other things. Uh, anybody in the room, you could actually turn on your mic and just, just ask us a question. We're happy to hear your voice. It also make for an, an, a, a contrasting voice on the, on the podcast. I just wanted to say thank you. And this was a wonderfully informative evening. Well, Stephanie, you're thinking about doing a one person show now. And I know that I've heard you talk about that. Um, what, what do you, what do you know? What do you need to know? What would you like to know from Stephanie that might give you some guidance in your shaping your, your own performance piece? I still need to do a lot of research before I even start putting, jotting down notes for myself. But I, I just found Stephanie's story so inspiring. Yeah, Stephanie, you're pretty amazing. <laughs> I, I don't hear a lot of stories like, like, like yours. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's extraordinary. I think one, one other story that, that parallels yours in some ways is Angelina Fiore de Lisi at the Cherry Lane Theater. Um, but, but the, you know, very, very different, different, very different art form. And, but man, she found the, she found the cherry lane. She bought the cherry lane. So, um, candy. Yes. So I have a question, Stephanie, uh, because I totally agree with Bob. I have seen some really unfortunate solo performers because they don't have a director. Do you find that directors who are used to doing directing of solo shows or people who have just their friend or a mentor direct them? Or do you find that the most successful solo shows are ones where the director is a director of all manner of theater and they help um, bring in some of those elements uh, when solo performers are going to choose a director or looking for a director? What is your- I, I, I wanna hear your answer too, but I, but I wanna quickly say that there are there are some directors who are so tuned into the form to into the solo form that that they that they do bring something to it that not everybody else does. I think of Gretchen Cryer in particular. She is so dedicated to that form, and she has such an understanding of it. She helps guide people, and she helps them put together very successful performances. Um, that's not to say that, that that other directors aren't able to do it. Stephanie, your turn. I think. You know, like if you find a good, you have to find somebody you want to work with, right? There's two things. How well do you work together? And obviously a solo performance and, and, you know, there's directors and then there's collaborators, right? So, you know, the collab dramaturg, collaborator, director, whether the director and the dramaturg are the same one. I mean, you know, we, I just keep going back to David Ford, who does an amazing job developing the show. Um, so there's that aspect. When I developed my solo performance, I literally worked with a guy from Bar Barcelona who was incredible. It just happened to be, and he was not necessarily a solo performer, but he took my level. He did a different kind of staging type of thing. And it might be you work with different people for different things, right? So you have your collaborator, you have your director, you know, 
you you want to get your music right you know all those things you want to get your performance you know right and you might end up working with a bunch of different people that can support different aspects of the the piece you are developing but to do it alone you have to be like an alien from out of space so good it's very hard to do it alone and it's equally hard you know that's what's been so hard about covid is developing because we give many places to develop the, the piece in front of an audience you can go to the monday night for a 15 minute piece you can go to the rising and there's also the aspect of needing the audience to find out what works and doesn't work because it might work in your head but when you get it in front of an audience something that worked in your head doesn't work for the audience and the things that you thought were never going to work work incredibly well. Don, Don Reed, do you have your hand raised or are you just saying that? Uh, there you are. No, yeah, yes. Um, um, I wanted to say a couple of things on directing. Um, uh, first, Stephanie gives you the, the scope and breadth to do what you choose and what works for you. And what I'd like to just state for people listening is if you have a strong background in stand-up, you lean less on the need for uh, a director. You can have the collaboration comes into play with creative consultants who might make comments, but as a person, and I'm not talking about just doing transferring stand-up straight into the stage. I'm talking about a full play with multiple characters. Um, there are ways to take yourself, and if you have, a, you have to have a very strong background in stand-up though, because when you're doing stand-up each night for years, you're writing, producing, directing, and performing your own show every night. This is something I learned from Robert Townsend and Keenan Wayans and some of those folks in uh, Los Angeles as I've worked with them for years. But I, I want to state to anyone who has a strong background in stand-up, uh, use the collaboration of maybe creative consultants and your ultimate collaboration, which is the audience. And if you've got some great creative consultants and some key people making comments and you come from a strong stand-up background, Ground. Like uh, Stephanie uh, has that uh, amazing eye not to over comment. Some people who produce content are they're just so quick to make sure their their scent is on your show. Sometimes the best comment is uh, that it's right, that you got it right. And then they'll laser in. I have a project coming up. She made a comment on um, that was the exact thing that it needed. Um, but in, in that site, I know a lot of people do a lot of leaning on um, on directors. And I highly suggest if you don't have a strong background, make sure it's crucial. But if you have a strong stand-up background uh, and are a, you know, a capable actor, there's a long way you can go. But that's um, all. Thanks. And thank you, Stephanie, so much. Thanks, Don. Um, the one thing that we actually didn't, didn't mention, and, and this we really have to wind up very, very quickly. Um, we didn't talk about the difference between solo performances that are based on your life and solo performances that are based on the character. And solo performances where you play 16 characters. Uh, there are different kinds of solo performance. So I think the, uh, the, the, the hardest one um, to break away from the possible narcissism are the ones where you're telling your own story. So it's always really very, I think it's very crucial to have an outside eye to help you shape your story. And you also have to find out what's universal about your story. Well, yes, you went through something that is harrowing or amazing or whatever, but how does, how does it, why does, why does that matter to an audience? What, how did they relate to your experience? Um, so uh, just to, just to acknowledge that solo performance is not one thing. It's really dozens of different forms. Uh, and we really yeah. didn't touch on that. Um, okay. I'm going to see, I don't see any other hand raises. So uh, I'm just going to, and, and my sunlight now is coming in, pouring in and taking away my green screen. So, so here I am on YouTube with this big splash of green behind me. Everybody forgive me for it. It's, it doesn't look very professional, but I'm going to do my wind up speech right now. And uh, I want to thank before okay. you do that, can I just I just want to thank you, thank you, Bob, for having me on for doing this incredible series that you do. And also everybody here and, you know, contact me and I may be really slow to get back to you. It is an extremely difficult time in my life as well as just I'm behind for a lot of reasons. So if I don't get back to you, just 
every couple of weeks, just, just try again. And I'm Stephanie at themarsh.org. Um, want to see how we can work with as many and support as many of you all that we can. And thank you. Well, thank you. And thank, thank you for being with us. Um, <laughs> my green screen is just like the blob is, is invading my green screen screen right now. Um, nothing I can do about it. I've got a, a blinding su sunset happening outside my window. Um, so I want to thank everybody for being with us today. I want to thank uh, viewers out there, whether it's podcast or YouTube, wherever you are. Um, thanks for finding your way to true. If you want to be part of the room, if you want to be in here and actually ask the questions and be part of the conversation, you're always welcome. Just email me at trunltd at aol.com. Yes, I have an AOL address. Yes, I do. Um, but it's trunltd at aol.com. And we'll put you on the list and we'll invite you every week. Um, next week, I have a pretty interesting guest coming. Uh, some of you may have heard of jo Joe Iconis. He's the guy that wrote Be More Chill. And we're going to talk about how social media made him a star. Uh, and we're going to talk about how cast albums and recordings of your music uh, can be very helpful in getting you productions. Um, it's called which comes first, the cast album or the production. Um, we're going to talk about a lot more than that. So join us next week with Joe Iconis. Iconis. Um, and uh, we do this for free. You don't have to pay. However, we do call it pay what you can. So if you can pay something, uh, we'd be very grateful for the help and for the for the uh, support. Um, we're at, you can donate at True Donate. We have a, we have a link that goes to our, goes to our page. It's True Donate, T-R-U Donate.com. Very simple, True Donate, T-R-U Donate.com. So go to True Donate.com and give us something if you have it and if you don't just continue coming back and being with us because we love having you here um thank you everyone and uh that's it for today